we're going to uh, deal with a subject that I haven't dealt with in a while, um, but I think it's necessary. And we're talking about briefly tonight, um, handling offenses biblically. Handling offenses biblically. How many of you know we are challenged in life as well as the church by the spirit of offense? It is responsible for a lot of the breakups and the breakdowns in relationships, both in and out of church, in your own families. We sometimes get offended and we stay offended and we see the result in the relationships that it causes things to go down. It causes relationship to struggle. It causes people sometimes to live in the same house but don't talk to each other. You know, it causes people to go to the same church and won't even hug each other. It's the reason sometimes why there are church splits and church hurts because of offense. And so I, I want to share tonight and briefly discuss how to handle offense from a biblical standpoint. Now, the word offense in the dictionary, it is something that causes a person to be hurt, angry, or upset. Offense, it is an annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. Um, how many have ever been offended? I think, I think we all have. It's what we do with the offense that's important, how we handle the offense. And the Bible speaks on offenses. Let us go to Luke. The 17th chapter. Luke 17, verse number one. And shout glory when you get there. Well, we got one there. And this is what the word says. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible but that offenses will come. Somebody say they will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. The Bible warns the person that causes offenses. It says they're going to come and you might be offended, but woe unto you if you're the one that's causing the offense. Verse 2. Verse 2 says, It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. It's a serious offense, pun intended. Take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. In other words, Handle it right there. Right? It says, if he trespass, trespass against you, rebuke him. Say, hey, bro, you crossed the line. Transgress thy. Transgress thy. Where you have overstepped your boundaries. So you trespass. Rebuke him. And if he repent, he says, don't hold it against him. Say, brother, I forgive you. And some of you say, well, you got one time, but then the scripture knows your thoughts. <laughs> and it says, and he, if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, somebody say seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shall forgive him. That's deep, ain't it? Yeah. See, I give you two, three, seven times. It's letting you know the extent of how far 
you should be willing to go to forgive your brother. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we are okay with this scripture depending on who it is. Like some people be like, yeah, for them, I'll forgive them. But certain people, and oftentimes the reason being is because these certain people, we are offended with them over and over again. And sometimes it builds up, you know, a spirit of offense that we have against uh, certain people um, or towards certain people. It's not only who it is, but it's also what someone has done to us. So we, we're saying, yep, I can forgive. I can overlook the offense, but it depends on who it is. And it depends on what they have done. Because immediately when we say forgive, we say, but you don't understand what they have done. Can the church say amen? Uh, usually these are the next words that goes through the mind of those of us who are harboring. I want to use that word harboring offenses. See, because if you said that, you don't know what they have done. And that's your testimony. You don't know what they have done. More than likely, you are guilty of harboring an offense. Can the church say amen? The truth about the matter is what they have done. This sounds callous, but I don't care. I do care about your hurt, but I don't care to hear the excuses for living with offenses. Because the Bible says, and I think we are children of God, and we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, and he has forgiven us of all of our sin. And so because of that, we have to understand he's forgiven us who are we to hold somebody else? Now, it doesn't mean that we have to um, be um, uh, continue to put ourselves in a position to where we are continually victimized by people. Amen? It's important that we use wisdom. It's important that we um, walk according to knowledge and understanding and understand who we're dealing with and guard ourselves and even guard our hearts. Can the church say amen? amen? But we have to come to a point to where we are determined not to live with offenses, whining and self-pity and harboring bitterness because life has dealt us such a raw deal. Now here's the truth. Again, we are surrendered to Christ. And when you are surrendered to Christ, you surrender your rights. Can the church say amen? amen. How many know that we live this Christian life and we, we do a lot of things now that we don't want to do. But because he says that we ought to do it, we do it. When you give your life to Christ, you're saying that you, you subscribe to the, when the Bible says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for you that persecute you and despitefully use you. You know, if you just love the people that love you, the Bible says the world does that. So we have to go and the scripture in the New Testament, in the realm of the spirit, it transcends that of even the law. The law, it transcends, you know, like the scripture says, you have heard it been said that you should love God and hate your enemies. But he says in the New Testament, but I say unto you that you should love your enemies. And so he deals with the spirit or the heart of the matter. Somebody say, yep, the heart of the matter. You no longer have the right to sit on the throne of your life. You know, because of Christ, 
you enthrone him, right? He sits on the throne of your heart. Is that right? So now we're saying that we're walking like him, we're talking like him, we're living like him, we're behaving like him, we're taking on what he gives to us in his word as our, as our standard, as the principles that we live by. And so we may uh, be used to cussing somebody out, but the Bible says, bless them that curse you. So I change my ways to align with scripture. All of us have a philosophy that we live by. But when, when, when our philosophy is challenged by his truth, we have to drop our philosophy and receive his truth. Right? We got all of this before Christ information that we replace with the after Christ information that overwrites what we have believed and our modes of operation and practices. So that's how we become more and more like Christ as we grow, as we continue to live this Christian life. Am I talking right? How many know you've been bought with a price? So the Bible says you are not your own. So, I mean, you can't say, well, I just want you to save me, but I want to live however I want to live. No, he says, I purchase you. You're a purchased possession, so you don't belong to yourself. You belong to me. The truth is, is when we hold offense against another, we are walking in the flesh. Oh, let me say that again. When we hold offense against another, we are walking in the flesh. Galatians 5, verse 24, it says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. So we um, crucify the flesh when we belong to Christ. Paul said, I die daily. That means that every day you have to make a decision to crucify this flesh and the affections and the lusts, all the stuff that come with the flesh. Amen? So we got to look at our self-centeredness. Sometimes we are self-centered. And so we think that we have the right to feel this way or to be this way or to act this way. But we say that we have surrendered our rights and that Christ for you, I live and for you, I will die. Can the church say amen? I know many are saying I deserve to be offended, right? Because oftentimes the offense, we can understand the average person can understand why you are offended. It's not saying that you shouldn't have gotten offended. It's really saying that okay, you have been offended, but are you going to respond to this offense in a Christ-like manner or are you are just going to harbor the offense, pet the offense? You know, so sometimes we get to the place to where it becomes our little pet. Y'all know what I'm saying? Where something has happened and so this is our little hurt. And so we, we become one with our hurt. How many ever, how many understand what I'm saying? We become one with our hurt, and, and so we start to wear our stripes like Adidas. You know? So the thing about it is that offense and you are not the same thing. That offense, the Bible says that we ought to let them go. Give them to God. Repent. And seek forgiveness. Even from the one God who judges us rightly. How do we handle offenses biblically? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Matthew, the 18th chapter. So we're going to start doing this if we haven't done it yet. We're going to start doing it just like this. So, you know, hey, it's giving you the roadmap. It says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, 
Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Who? Thee is you and him. Or you and her. Okay? It's not just him. It could be her. Not everybody else. Don't go tell everybody else about what they did to you. Because oftentimes we get offended and we want to go tell everybody else what so-and-so did to you. But it's not loving them properly. You're not loving them properly by doing that. Um, sometimes we don't have the courage sometimes to go and tell. But the Bible says we should be straightforward. Right? We should go to that person and say, hey, sis, let me let you... Uh, can I talk to you for a second? You know, I'm offended by, and you can use those words, I'm offended by what you said at the sisterhood function. <laughs> you know, bro, when we had talk golf, you did something that it rubbed me the wrong way. And I'm offended, Right? Now, listen, when you do that, um, you got to be prepared for the other person's response. Because they may say, well, Elder Keith said that's too bad. They may say, well, I don't understand why you were offended by that. Right? But see, it's, it's a perceived thing. I perceive you wronged me. I perceive you insulted me. It don't even have to be true, but if a person's perception is their reality, a person's perception is their reality, so in their mind, you have done something to them. And so the godly thing to do on the responders end is to say, you know what? You know, my apologies. I didn't mean or it wasn't my intentions or that's not what I meant. Come on, y'all helping me, right? Right? Or just say, I'm sorry, because you did mean it. Right? You know, we say, my bad, right? My bad. So you got to be prepared for the response. And the response should be, in a godly manner, all things being equal, my bad, my apologies, I didn't mean to offend you. And then the offense is handled at that point, right? Okay? But listen, but if he will not hear thee, no, it says him and alone. If he shall hear thee, Thou hadst gained thy brother. Is that what it said? But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two. So, Pastor Tim, I need you to come with me. One or two more, and that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, then the Bible says, so the first step is to tell the brother, the second step is to get a couple witnesses and y'all go to them. And if they neglect to hear both you by yourself or with your witnesses, then the Bible says, tell it to the church. So, you know, Wednesday night. <laughs> at the end of service, we're going to have a time for you to handle your offenses. No, I'm just kidding. Now, it said tell it to the church. Now, so what that could be is you could, you could bring it to the elders of the church. You could bring it to the elders of the church, right? Because the whole thing about it is not about embarrassing anyone. But like if it's something, somebody's sowing discord in the church or somebody is willfully trying to cause harm to the church, it's important that you bring the issue up 
and that we deal with it from a corporate standpoint because the Bible says that at a certain point, if he neglect to hear the church, the elders, or even the pastors, it says, let him be unto thee as a heathen man in a publican. And so there are even some cases where the, the offense is so severe or the person won't hear or the person won't conform to where uh, they even have to be excommunicated from the church. That's an option. Amen? But that's very severe. Somebody say very severe. And so we're going to go through every single uh, scenario to try to uh, recover that brother or that sister. But as a last resort, then um, the Bible says, treat them as a heathen or a publican. This is what the scripture says in Matthew 18, verse 21. It says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Y'all remember that, right? Again, here are these seven times, till seven times. And then Jesus said to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And somebody said, well, they got 489 more. <laughs> and so that's not even the intent. What it is saying is that to infinity and beyond. No, what it is saying is that you should forgive as many times as necessary. Can the church say amen? amen? Now, it's important that we go to others rather than waiting on them to come to us. Y'all understand what I'm saying? No? Like, <laughs> well, you know, they if they don't know you offend, if they don't know they offended you, then they don't know, right? Right. But sometimes y'all know something's up, right? Right. You just like something's off, right? Like we're we're not connecting like we used to. Something's going on, right? And you're trying to figure it out. And so the Bible even talks about if you have a gift. If you have a gift, you want to go um, offer that gift at the altar or even give of your offering. And you remember your brother has an ought against thee. Somebody say an ought against you. Not that you have an ought against them, but he said they have an ought against you. Go to your brother, restore your brother, then come back and offer your gift. In other words, it's saying if you are aware that there's something off, then the Bible says you have a responsibility. It says don't even come and offer your gift. It gives the inference that your gift may not even be accepted because there is some ought. Right? Now, we know the Bible says when you're staying and praying, forgive. Right? So, because... When you pray with unforgiveness in your heart, you hinder your prayers. It's in the scripture. So if a brother has an awe, if a sister has an awe, or you remember they have awe, or something's off, whatever, you want to get that right. Relationships are important. Being at peace is important. Unity is important. Love is important in the house of God, you know, because you have a lot of people that go to church for a long time, have arts for a long time and never say anything. They just dodge and stay away and avoid. And the enemy has a foothold. He gets a toehold. He gets a foothold. And if you're not careful, he can get a stronghold. You don't even sit on this side because so-and-so sits on this side of the church in the house of God where we love one another. And so, you know, oftentimes we wonder sometimes, why is a church struggling to grow? It's because oftentimes it's because the spirit of offense is in the church. And you know, when, when, when sheep needs still waters and green pastures, so sometimes it's that the members of the church are offended. So when people come, they don't feel, they don't sense the peace or the tranquility or the green pastures or the spirit of unity and love well enough to connect to this church. 
or that church. So we don't want to be the hindrance for the church of the Lord growing, whether it be the local church or the body of Christ at large, because we are harboring offense. I remember, I, I remember my, um, you know, growing up, growing up, and, you know, I had this conversation. Y'all hear the conversation as I tell it, I'll tell the story. But um, growing up, you know, me and my dad, we had a very challenging relationship, very challenging relationship. And, uh, you know, old school. Y'all know old school. They say stuff. They say stuff, all kinds of stuff to you. Now, y'all, y'all kids now, y'all, y'all, y'all don't understand. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we got beat with stuff that you ain't supposed to get beat with. You know what I'm saying? It, it was child abuse in a lot of cases, basically, right? So for in my case, it was it was words, right? And there were words that I carried on even when I went in the army. I start, still heard words from my dad ringing in my head, in my ear. And, and it affected how I interacted with other people, what I thought of myself, my whole self-concept was based upon the words that he said to me. I won't tell y'all the words because I don't want y'all to get mad at my dad. <laughs> so, so, so years later, I was listening to a radio um, program, Christian radio program, and they said on there, they said, you know, if you have an art um, against uh, someone in your family or someone, it's, it's important that you... Uh, go to them and that you be prepared to forgive them. Be prepared to forgive them. In fact, you know, already have it in your heart to forgive them. And when you go share it, and this is what the, they were telling me on the radio. So I'm listening to it say, when you go share it, it says, it doesn't matter the response. I said, what? Because forgiveness, it said, is for you, it is for the person. So regardless of the response, so I went and I talked to my dad and I shared my heart and I gave the instance and I told him exactly what he said and how many times he probably said it and this and that or the other. And he listened, he listened, and he got quiet. And when I finished, he says, is that it? I said, yeah. He said, did it kill you? I said, no. He said, then it was good for you. Look how you turned out. Somebody said old school, right? But I had already decided before I talked to him that no matter what he said, I would forgive. And that day I forgave my dad. I didn't go into it. Well, you know what? That's so insensitive. No. Nope. I had a revelation because I realized I needed to get free. And from that point on, that point on, that thing strengthened me so greatly that my self-concept went up several notches and my thoughts about myself went up several notches because I was able to forgive my dad. Am I talking right? Yes, sir. Good. So I went to him. That's a, that's a, he didn't even know I was offended. I went to him. Amen? Amen. Mark, Mark, Mark the 11th chapter, verse 24. Mark 11, verse 24. It says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. All this praying you're doing. Now, it would be a crying shame, all this praying you're doing, but you got a grudge against somebody and it just hitting the ceiling. God just collecting your prayers until you go and deal with this offense. Your stuff is on hold. The enemy has an advantage over you because of that. 
It says, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You got to keep your heart. Keep your heart clean. Keep your heart pure. Don't allow stuff to just linger and be there in your heart and you be okay with it. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know you're starting to look out with green eyes. You got to deal with that. You know? Eyes of envy or eyes of jealousy or eyes of uh, where, where there's bitterness. We got to deal with it. We got to guard our heart. We got to get that stuff out of our heart to make sure that we're not hindering ourselves hindering our prayers or causing there to be or we be the problem for the breakdown in relationships scripture says in Ephesians the fourth chapter verse 26 we're going to have some hugging after this be ye angry and sin not let not the sun go down upon your wrath why is that why you don't want to go to bed angry you may not wake up. You're absolutely right. You may not wake up. You know, uh, you may not get the opportunity. But also, when you go to bed angry, guess what that anger does? You know how you, 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 know you got that, that crock pot? That thing just simmers and saturates and marinates in your heart in your heart so you you don't go to bed angry you know if you can help it you know what I mean go ahead and say you know whatever you got to do before you go to bed say you know I don't want to sleep on this because I don't want to allow this thing to turn into bitterness you know that's why a lot of anger start out it start out as anger and ends up bitterness and bitterness is because it is seeped down in the heart is marinated, it's been saturated, you turn that thing over and over and over, now it's a part of the stew. The Bible says, neither give place to the devil. That's what we're doing. We give place to the devil. You're giving the devil an entryway to get a toehold or a foothold or a stronghold in your life. So don't give place to the devil. Tell your neighbor, don't give place to the devil. Amen. Say not, in Proverbs 24, verse 29, it says, Say not, I will do so to him as he have done to me. It says, Say not, I will render to the man according to his work. You know, the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Render unto uh, no man evil for evil. That's what the scripture says, I believe in Romans. The Bible says, um, in doing so, um, you heap coals of fire on the head. Like when, when somebody does evil towards you, you don't do evil towards them. Bible says that in doing so, they're going to come up under their own judgment. You let them, you don't, you don't have to pay them back. But this is also what the scripture says in Psalms 119, verse 165. It says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Sometimes the problem is, is that we're too easily offended. Too easily offended. Why are we so easily offended? That's a question. And so the scripture saying is that when we get in God's word and we love God's law and his principle, the Bible says is, it is hard for us to be offended. You know, I had people say to me as the pastor said, as my pastor, you can't offend me. And I don't know if it was true. But, but you should, as you grow and mature in Christ, you should not be so easily offended. What it says is that we are not as mature 
as we think we are. We're wearing our feelings on our sleeves. Because some things should be like water off a duck's back. Some things may even be intended to offend you. And you're not offended. Because really, you listen, it's about really loving oneself and having a good self-concept and, un, and understanding what the scripture says and already uh, mature and fortified against it. To where now you're more concerned about other people than you are yourself. But if we are self-centered, it's easy to get offended. But when you are thinking about others more than you think about yourself, you don't even take it. You, you, sometimes you're thinking, they must be having a bad day. You know what I mean? They, they must be having a bad day. I'm not even going to hold that to their charge. But if you get offended at every uh, 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 offense intent, it's probably because you're not as mature. In the Bible... may even call you um, a babe. Some, some may be a babe. Amen? Yeah. Offense manifests in two categories, externally and internally. Externally is anger, going off on people, right? Just going off on people, right? Because that person is offended. So the angry, going off on people, revenge, little nasty comments, that's how offense, you know, little snide, little nasty comments, those little snipe shots, shots fired. What about gossip? Right? You ain't taking, going to the person, but you're going to everybody else. And that could be directly or indirectly sharing to spread the offense. It could be directly or indirectly sharing the offense. The thing about it is, is that when you, the Bible says six things the Lord hate. And he says one of them is sowing discord among the brethren. And so when we sow discord among the brethren, God says, I hate that about you. Not that I hate you, but I hate that about you. The Bible says the Lord hates those things. I know y'all say he's a God of love. Yep, but it says 16 the Lord hates. Hands that shed innocent blood, feet that run into mischief, proud look, lying tongue. Right? And amongst him, he that sow a discord amongst the brethren. Internally, internally is the second way. And internally is resentment, haughty looks puffed up attitudes, bitter spirits, hatred, even sickness and disease. Don't you know that harboring offense can rot your soul? It can even cause you to get physically sick. And sometimes we get to the point where we just say, I don't even want to deal with people, and we caught cutting people off because we've allowed it to get to that point. But the question is, who gets robbed the most? The person with the offense gets robbed the most. Let me give you these seven things real quick. It's, it's real quick about offenses and um, that will help, help you to overcome them. Number one, don't be dismayed by Christians that will hurt your feelings. Like, I can't believe it. In the house of God, believe it. Right? It happens. There's people that you worship with that love Jesus that will offend you. The Bible says offenses will come. You say you can rest assured that they will come. Number two, when you get hurt by someone, your own spiritual maturity is revealed. You find out where you are. These are things you need to know. Whenever you, you know you get hurt easily, it's telling you your, your level of spiritual maturity. Because at that point, it's letting us know that we walk in our feelings. 
The Bible said walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. If we walk in the feelings, you can't walk in the feelings and effectively walk in the spirit at the same time. The spirit man has to lead and rule the house. Can the church say amen? amen? Seven things you need to know about offense. Number three, what you do with your hurt is a choice you make. So we need to forgive like Christ. Number four, other people's offenses are not yours. Don't take on other people's offenses. Like if they offended, don't let it become yours. Like now they just told you, now you offended. No, 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 no. You got enough to carry on your own. You don't want nobody else's junk. Can the church say amen? amen? Number five, God works all your hurts together for your good. So even the things that you have been offended by, God has a way of working it all together for your good. They're not good, but he has a way of working them together for your good. So thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Number six, your offense, their offense is not okay with God. Right? And I gave you the scripture, if you have a brother... If you remember your brother has an order against you. So God is saying neither one is okay. Your offense, whether it's your offense or their offense, is not okay with God. And number seven, you can live free of offenses by staying in the love of God. By staying in the love of God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. I'm getting close to being done here tonight. 1 Corinthians 13. Is this good? Yes, sir. Is this needed? Yes, sir. 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. This is the character of love. Charity suffers long. Charity is kind. Love envieth not. The character of love. Love on it not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly or seeketh not her own or not easily provoked to anger. Thinketh no evil. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in truth. Beareth all things. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never fails. So love is really the remedy. And when you start loving, you are less offended because love is altruistic. Love does not focus on itself. It's not self-centered. And so, you know, greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Jesus was not focused on himself. Greater love have no man that a man lay down his life for his friend. In other words, he didn't consider himself, but he considered the world that needed saving. So he gave of himself. And that's how love is. It endureth all things, beareth all things. Am I talking right? So we need to love better. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing there's just too little of. Do I have a, like three, four more minutes? Psychologists have verified that if you do something wrong to someone you dislike, you dislike them more. This is what Apostle Holcomb, this is his research in, out of one of his books. It says, that means if you do something good to someone you dislike, you dislike them less. 
Y'all understand what I'm saying? That's why the Bible said, do good to them that hate you. You dislike them less, and you move closer to the love of God. Uh, offense, that word, and I'm almost done, is the Greek word skandalon, which is a bait or a trap. That's what an offense is. It's bait or a trap. And John Bevere, he has this book called the, the Bait of Satan. How many have ever heard of that? Right? And the leaders, Pastor D has already sent it out for the leaders to get that book, and we plan on uh, discussing that book on our um, leadership meeting, I believe on the 26th or the 27th, one of those dates. And so leaders come prepared. But I want to encourage the entire congregation to get that book. You know, I actually debated whether or not I wanted to do some type of book review in the midweek over that, but I couldn't figure out exactly how to do it. But I want to encourage you to get that book and read that book because he goes into detail about this bait of Satan. John Bevere says that there are, there are many that are unable to function properly in their calling because of the wounds and hurts that offenses have caused in their lives. They are handicapped and hindered from fulfilling their potential. Let me take you this last scripture, and then we're going to be done tonight. Psalms 55, verse number 12. Put it up in the NLT. Yep. This, this is the challenging thing. It says, it is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. But verse 13, instead, it is you, my equal, my companion, and close friend. What good fellowship we once enjoy as we walk together to the house of God. He's saying, listen, it wasn't an enemy. It was a close acquaintance, a friend, you. And you know you got to care for someone in order for them to really offend you. The greatest offenses happen to people who actually at one time loved each other, cared for one another. You know, they said the greatest, the most vicious thing is divorce court. These are people who once loved each other, said I do, and now they can't stand each other, hate one another guts. So what we need to understand is that, 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 that the people that are closest to, to, to you have the ability to offend you the most. But whether, regardless of where the offense comes from, we got to learn how to handle offenses. You just know that, that, you know, nobody can get under my skin like my wife. I guarantee you I can't get under her. Nobody can get under hers like I can. But, you know, we know each other buttons, right? Am I talking right? And nobody can offend me like she can. But listen, and I nobody I can't nobody can offend her like I can. Um the thing about it is we got to understand it. We got to be mature about it, right? We got to be mature about it. Y'all remember the final story. I'm going to let you go. I said that was my last scripture. <laughs> Y'all remember Cain and Abel? Cain was offended at God. And he was offended with his brother. Cain was an offended guy. He was offended. And, you know... And uh, God come to Cain and asked Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he gave God a snide coming. Am I my brother's keeper? You're talking to God, man. And the Bible said, he said, listen, if you do as well, 
you know, your, your offering would have been accepted, you know? But, but see, it was something about his offering, his attitude. He just had an attitude. I don't know at what point where he got offended. Well, it was that when God accepted Cain's, uh, Abel's offering and didn't accept his. So he had, he felt justified in his offense. But see, if you don't deal with offense, offense will deal with you. And it got to the point to where this is the worst case of an offense to where it came to the point that they were out in the field. The Bible says that Cain was so mad, so offended with his brother that he rose up and killed him, his brother Abel. The Bible says that his brother Abel's blood was crying from the ground, crying from the ground. And then there was a, uh, you know, Cain at that point, he, he allowed his offense to take him to the worst place. Now, you know, we may not uh, murder anyone, but the Bible says is that what happens is, is that when the Bible talks about us being angry with our brother without a righteous cause, that, that we are like murderers. That's what the scripture says. It's the spirit of murder. It's the spirit of hatred, bitterness, anger, resentment. All of those things has a way of getting. If we don't deal with it, it will, it will grab its cousins. It will grab its cousins. It just don't stay there, but bitterness, anger, resentment, jealousy, envy, strife. It starts to gather all of the cousins. And it piles on. And you find yourself, you can't stand somebody. Somebody say, let it go. You have to forgive and get over the offense. Somebody say, forgive and get over the offense. Amen.